Lesson 26 is graphing radical functions. We're going to graph two types, square root functions, cube root functions as well. So all the square root functions will be on the left and the cube roots will be on the right side of the page. And we're going to start with the parent functions for each. So for the parent functions, we're going to use a table to graph them. And when you graph the table, you pick values for x that you can sub into the function in order to find complete points. And because our functions are radical functions, we have to like be cons like we have to think about what values for x we put into the function, like what are numbers that I should actually take the square root of because I don't want to deal with like obnoxious decimals. If I were to like say pick x equals 2 and put that in there and I would, then I would add the square root of 2, that would do me no good. Okay, so whenever you're graphing a square root function, not just the parent function, you want to think about, you know, what is the smallest number that I can take a square root of? The smallest number I can take square root of is 0 because I can't take a square root of a negative number. So I have to kind of just start at zero and work my way up from there. My The next number I can take the square root of is one. And then after that, the next number I can take the square root of is four. So we really have to think about perfect squares. Um, so like zero, of course, is zero squared. But then after that, it's one, four, nine, 16. 25 and so on those are all examples of perfect squares because you get them from like one squared two squared three squared four squared five squared so with graphs of course we want to kind of keep our points a little bit small so we're not going to make our graphs huge so that's why we just do zero one and four for our parent function for a square root so if i were to put x equals zero into this function i would be taking the square root of zero which my output would be zero because the square root of zero is zero and then if I were to take x equals 1, oops, sorry, take x equals 1 and put that into the function, the square root of 1 is 1, so that would be my output. And then if I were to take 4 and put it in the function, the square root of 4 is 2, so that would be my output there. So keep in mind here. I am not putting plus or minus two. I know sometimes like we do that when we're solving, we have to like kind of include like what possible outcomes there are for X in a certain equation. That is not the case with graphing because one of the rules of a function is that each input can only have one output. So if I say that like the out and input, just I probably haven't reviewed this in a while. Input is all the X's, it's the domain and then output is all the y's, it's the range. So if I say like I put in four and I take the square root and I get positive or negative two, that input of four has two different outputs, positive two and negative two. So it makes it not a function. So we don't do that when we're graphing. And then now we're ready to go ahead and just graph our points. A table is just a different way of organizing points. So this would be like the point zero, zero. So I can put a point there. And then this would be one, one. So I can put a point there. And then this would be 4, 2. So I can put a point there. And then before we like kind of connect our points, it can be like really tempting to like draw like a line throughout all of our points. But we have to think about like if I were to go backwards on my table and like say I were to try to put in x equals negative 1 or something in here, that would be undefined because we can't take the square root of a negative number and get a real outcome. We can get an imaginary number, but we can't graph an imaginary number. So that negative one would not be a part of the domain. So it shouldn't be a part of our graph. So what that means is that this point zero zero is really like a starting point. You won't go anywhere like to the left of that. You'll start there and then go to the right of it. So we'll start at zero zero and then we'll connect through the points to the right and it'll like really flatten out a lot. And you can always like, put the function into Desmos if you want to get a feel for what the whole graph looks like. But the reason it flattens out so much is because, you know, we're having to keep putting in like bigger and bigger X values, like the next one would be nine, but the output would only be three. So it's like not that high. It's like uh, nine, three would be like pretty far to the right and then not that far up. Um, the next one would be like 16, four. So you could see like the X values are growing a lot higher than the Y values. So that's why the graph flattens out. Okay, so for domain and range, because that point zero zero is like a firm starting point for this graph, it's kind of like the vertex a little bit, um, but it's kind it's just like a firm starting point. So it limits the domain and range. It can't be all real numbers because it's like a start slash stop point. So the domain, we're starting at that point zero zero, 
and we're going to the right of it. So we're getting bigger from there. So the domain is gonna be from zero, zero to the right would be zero to infinity. And then if we're doing interval notation, so of course it's like a parentheses around infinity because you can never include infinity, but it's a bracket around zero because the domain does include zero, like we have that point zero, zero, so it definitely includes it. So remember brackets are for when it includes that number, parentheses are for when it doesn't. And then for range, so this was for domain, we're starting at x equals zero and then we're going to the right. For range, we're starting at y equals zero and we're going up from there. So the range looks exactly the same, it's just happens that way. Um, so the range would be from y equals zero and if we're going up from there, it would be up to infinity, parentheses around infinity. It includes y equals zero, so we put a bracket around zero as well. Okay, and then for max or minimum, if there's some sort of like domain limitation, um, or if like your graph basically isn't going up and down, like continuously forever, then there's going to be a max or a min. Um, in this case, um, we have a low point, like this is the lowest point that the graph will ever be, that kind of like starting point, and then it's just gonna continue to go up from there. So since it's a low point, it's gonna be a minimum, it's like kind of the bottom of the graph and then everything from there goes up and it would be at whatever the height of that point is, so at zero. And then for end behavior, we're so used to like end behavior being for both directions and we really only have one direction for this graph. So the one direction for this graph is it's going to the right. So we only need to write the line of end behavior that refers to the right side of the graph because this graph doesn't really go to the left. It kind of stops. So it would be as x approaches infinity, because x is getting bigger, that's going to the right. What is f of x doing? And that's just asking, is it going up or down? So something that's a little bit weird about these graphs is that, you know, they start to go really flat and they look like they're going to be perfectly horizontal, but they'll never be completely flat. Um, they can't be. So they'll never be completely flat. They're always going to be like steadily climbing, even if it's hard to see. So that means that f of x is going to infinity because the graph is always going up and to the right, even if it's at like a really slow pace. And then x-intercept, we can see it on the graph, it's at zero, zero, and that's the y-intercept as well, just at the origin. Okay, so that is our parent function for square roots. It's kind of like what the basis of all square root functions is. And then for cube root functions, you'll see that the table's bigger. And if we think about square root functions, so Square root functions, we can use like just a pretty small table to get a feel for the graph because you can only take square roots of positive numbers or zero. Um, but cube root functions, you can take cube root of negatives. So we still kind of want to start in the same spot, like kind of not the smallest number, but like the smallest, I guess, absolute value of a number that we can take the cube root of would be zero. So this time though, I'm going to put that in the middle. And then like cube roots, we don't, or perfect cubes, we don't always have those like kind of floating around our head as much, but like one cubed is one and then like two cubed is eight. So one and eight, those are perfect cubes. The next one, three cubed is three times three times three, which is 27. So we're gonna avoid using that. But for our table, we can put in X equals one. I'm gonna erase those so I can be zero for now. X equals one. And then we can also do negative one because you can take the cube root of a negative as well, because negative one cubed would be negative one times negative one times negative one, which is negative one. And then our next perfect cube is eight. So that'll be like kind of our furthest down value on the table. And then we want like our X values are the ones that are going inside the radical. So we want the ones that we can take the cube root of. So we're picking out of these perfect cubes, not like the basis of what's being raised to the third power. And then the last one is like, if I take negative two and I raise it to the third power, negative two times negative two times negative two, that would be negative eight. Sorry, it's not wanting to write. Negative eight. So that would be the last, or I guess technically the first value that we put on our table. And these are like the smallest numbers that we can take 
not like the smallest whole numbers or like non-fraction, non-rational numbers that we can take the cubed root of. So the next one after that would be like 27. And I don't want to make a graph that goes all the way up to 27 on the x-axis or negative 27. So we're going to stick with these. Okay, so each of our x values we're going to take the cubed root of. So let's see, when x equals negative 8, that goes in there. It's the cubed root of negative 8, which we just saw. Okay, so 2 cubed is negative 8, so the cubed root of negative 8 is negative 2. It's just like working backwards from cubing something. And then the next x value is negative 1. So if I were to put that in there, negative 1 inside the radical... We just talked about how if I take negative 1 and I raise it to the third power, I get negative 1. So if I work backwards, the cubed root of negative 1 is negative 1. And then, of course, the cubed root of 0, that's my next x value. The cubed root of 0 is 0. The cubed root of 1 is 1. And then the cubed root of 8, talked about that one up here. 2 cubed is 8, so the cubed root of 8, if we work backwards, is 2. Okay, so we have our table. We can kind of put our graph up there. So negative 8, negative 2. We're going to go left 8 down 2, so we'll be right there. And then negative 1, negative 1. We'll go left 1, down 1. And then 0, 0 um, on the origin. 1, 1. Right 1, up 1. And then 8, 2. So right 2, or sorry, right 8, up 2. And then we can connect them. You'll see it kind of like snakes through the middle and then like flattens out at the ends. I'm always bad at drawing them like evenly. It's probably the best one I've ever drawn. Um, okay, so that's what our graph looks like. And again, you can kind of pop the function into Desmos if you want to get a feel for like what the entire graph looks like. But now on to like domain and range. So for domain, like there's not really like that concrete like start or ending point for this graph. It goes in both directions forever because you can take the cube root of a negative number. So no x values are off limits like they were in the like square root function. So domain is all real numbers or we can say it's from negative infinity to positive infinity. And then domain, same situation here where it looks like the graph flattens out a lot, especially on mine, um, but it like will never be completely horizontal. It'll always slowly climb. It's just that the x values are going to increase a lot faster. So like, for example, the next value on my table would be 27 and then 3. So like we would go right 27 and then just go up 3. So it'd be like even more flat. So they're going to continue to like get higher and higher and higher and lower on the lower end. So range is going to be all real numbers as well. There's really no boundary line or limitations. So negative infinity up to positive infinity. And then because they're technically going up and down forever, there's no max or min because the max and min would have to be a high point or a low point. And you can't just say like the high point is infinity. It's not like a set number. So max or min is none. Okay, because there are kind of like two tail ends of this graph, we will have both lines for end behavior. Um, I know it, uh, I'm getting out of myself. Okay, so um, for end behavior, it's as x approaches negative infinity. So that's the left side, f of x approaches. So the left side of the graph, we'll look at that. It's at a snail's pace going down, but it's always gonna go down. And so even though it's slow, f of x is approaching negative infinity because it's going downward. And then the second line, as x approaches infinity, that's the right side of the graph, f of x approaches. So the right side of my graph, again, like I know it's increasing really, really slowly, but it's always going to be increasing like infinitely. So f of x is going towards positive infinity because the graph is always going up. So f of x approach is infinity. And this will honestly always be the case. The only exception is if there's a reflection on the graph. And if that happens then these would switch because basically the graph would look like that instead okay so x-intercept and y-intercept you can see them again it's at the origin because that's where it crosses both so x-intercept is at zero zero and then y-intercept is at zero zero as well 
Okay, so those are our parent functions. Um, there is a prettier version of some of this information in the workbook, so if you want to take a screenshot of that, um, if it's not already in your notes, but I know mine gets a little messy sometimes. Okay, so there are two options for graphing cubic functions. One is with transformations, one is with just making a table, so we'll do a couple of both. So the transformations, they have kind of like the same general format as the transformations we've done all year. Um, I will say I don't recommend using transformations if they are very complex equations or complex functions. So like, um, I'm going to kind of rework this formula. So as it's written right now, f of x equals a times the square root of 1 over bx minus h plus k, that has all of the transformations in there, every single possible one. Um, instead of that, I would only really recommend using transformations that function for functions that probably have just a h and a and or a k so x minus h plus k i'm going to take out everything else and then maybe if there's a negative a i wouldn't even really if worry if there's like a value for a like other than one but if it's just a negative sign then that's going to be a reflection over the x-axis And we'll see what that looks like in the very first example. So if there's anything else, if there's like a number other than one for A or like a number being multiplied by X, I probably would just make a table and that's what we do on the like second part of the notes. So example one, G of X equals, this, uh, sorry, negative square root of X plus three minus two. So the number that's inside of the radical with the X, that's H. So H is going to be in the spot of that three, but remember that, you know, this is X minus H. So it kind of is, you know, whatever it looks like, it's the opposite because this is really like X minus, and then the H value that turns that X minus into an X plus three is negative three. So that would mean that H is negative three instead of positive three. H is always kind of the opposite of what it looks like. And then for K, that's like the constant that's added or subtracted at the end, like outside of the radical though. That's important that it's outside the radical. So that's there. And then you'll see with this one, it does have the negative out in front. So that's what I was talking about over here. If you have a negative A value, negative one A value, then it's a reflection over the X axis. So that's how we're going to take our new piece by piece. So remember that H is horizontal translation. So that's how far we go left or right. And then K is the vertical translation. So that's how far we're going up or down. So if H, I'm going to write these off to the side now. So if H is negative three, that means we're going left three from the parent function. Since three and the left is like the negative direction for left or right. And then K is that like it's minus two where K is. So K would be negative two. You don't have to like switch the sign for K since in the formula itself, it's just plus K. So since K is negative two, we'd be going down two from the parent function. So H is left or right, K is up or down. And then I'm just gonna take the points from the parent function. So I'll zoom out a bit. It was this table up here because this is a square root, so we're going to use this set of points. So those points, and I'm not going to draw the whole graph, I'm just going to put the points on there, but not necessarily connect them. So there was a point at 0, 0, 1, 1, and then 4, 2. So those are kind of like my starting points. And um, sometimes it matters which order you go in for like order of operations, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, I would... So not, not for order of operations, excuse me, but for like transformations on a graph to be safe though, you should follow like the order of operations that would happen if you were to put something into the function and like simplify. So what I mean by that is if I were to put something into the function, let's see, um, I'm trying to grab a color that pops out. Okay. So if I were to put something in for X, the first thing I would do is 
add the three to the X. And then, so that means I'm going to do the like translation left three first. And like I said, sometimes it matters, sometimes it doesn't. And so it's just better to be safe and know that by default, go in the correct order. And then after I take the square root, then I would multiply whatever the square root is by a negative. So I'm going to do the reflection second. And then after that, I would subtract two. So the third thing I would do is go down two. The like step one and step two don't actually impact each other. So those could mix. However, you can't do the translation down before the reflection because that creates two different outcomes. So what I mean by that is that if I do, and this is just, we're not graphing yet. This is just going to show the difference. So let's say I do the reflection first. Um, when I reflect, if I'm flipping it over the x-axis, then my next set of points would be still at zero, zero because it's reflecting over itself. One, negative one if it flips down and then four, negative two. And then if I take those points and I move them down two, so like just based on k equals negative two, that lands me right here and then right here and right there. So that would be what would happen. And this is like just ignoring the horizontal translation for now. That's what happens if I do reflection first, translation second. If I do translation second and then reflection first, or sorry, I just said the same thing. Okay, so then that's what happens if I do the reflection first and then the vertical translation. If I do the vertical translation first and then I do the reflection after, I would have to bring all my points down to first. So that would bring me right here, right here, and right here. And then now if I reflect those negative two, zero, or sorry, zero, negative two becomes zero, positive two, one, negative one becomes one, positive one, and then four, zero reflects over itself. So this is what it should look like. This is what it does look like, or with the incorrect one is what it does look like. Okay, so I'm going to stop rambling on that point. The big thing is just, you know, order matters. So think order of operations when you put something in for X, what order would you follow to simplify? So first we would add the three. So I'm going to do the H part first, which is to shift everything left three. Um, so... If I shift everything left three, I can just count each of my individual points over. So let's see, I'll put those in pink. So everything left three would be one, two, three to the left right here, right here, and then right here. So that's my, just my translation left three. And then my second thing I was supposed to do was reflect over the x-axis. So I'm, now I'm going to take each of those points and flip them over the x-axis. So let's see, I'll do that in purple. So if I reflect over for this point, if I reflect over the x-axis, it's going to reflect over itself. So it stays in the same spot. For this point, it's going to go from negative to 1 to negative to negative 1. Just flips down. And then for this point, it goes from 1, 2 to 1, negative 2. Flips down below. And then now that I've done that, I can do the vertical translation. So I'll do that one in blue. I haven't used that one yet. So for the vertical translation, now I just need to count all of my most recent points. Those are the purple ones down two units. So down two units to right here, down two units to right here, and then down two units to right here. Okay, and then now I can go ahead and connect my points. It is kind of helpful though to pay attention to like, what was that original starting point? Like what was the zero, zero point? So first that zero, zero point, it moved left and then it got reflected and then it moved down. So this is my new kind of starting point and that's helpful so you can see like which which side does it continue on through and which side does it stop at? It's going to stop at that like new version of zero, zero, which is that point negative three, two. Okay, so now I can start there and then connect all the way through to the right. It looks a little bit different from the parent function, but that's because it's a reflection. So it's just flipped upside down. Okay, I'm going to briefly go through one other thing that you can do if you feel comfortable enough with it. So if you, this is going to be really quick, so you, if you're interested in it, you might have to replay it. 
But what another option is, is you could reflect first. So starting from the parent function, if I reflected it, I would get this point, this point, and then this point. And then my translations were left three down two. So I can just count each point left three down two. And that'll give me the same function as well. So there's a bunch of different ways to do it. Um, the biggest thing, like can't stress enough, you cannot do a vertical translation before a reflection. It just doesn't work out. Okay, so now domain and all that other information. So it's important to point out what that kind of starting point is. This one is at negative three, negative two, because you know it was at zero, zero for the parent function, but then we went left three and down two. So our new starting point is negative three, negative two. So for the domain, it's starting at negative three and it's going to the right. So it's from negative three to the right, which is to infinity. It includes negative three in the domain. So there's a bracket around that, the parentheses around infinity. For the range, it's starting at negative two, but this time instead of going up, it's going down from that starting point. So it's going to negative infinity. So includes negative two, so bracket around there, parentheses around negative infinity. And then for max or min, because this one has that kind of a firm starting point, there is gonna be a max or a min. That starting point is the highest point on the graph this time though. So it's going to be a maximum and it's whatever the height of that point is, which the height of that point is negative two. So negative two. And then for end behavior, because this graph tail only goes in one direction, there's only one line of end behavior, this graph goes to the right. So our end behavior is gonna be as x approaches infinity, that's the right side of the graph. This time it's going down, it's not going up, it's going down, so f of x would be approaching negative infinity. Sorry, that got kind of close. Okay, so have to kind of pay attention to like, yes, the parent function, it was like both were going to positive infinity, but this is a reflection. So instead of going up, it's going down. And then for the X intercept, can't really tell what it is. So we got to go and find it. So in order to find an X intercept, if we think about what this point is, it's like, I don't know why I said X intercept. Um, I like started to think about Y intercept. Okay, so X intercept backtracking a little bit. Um, if we look at this graph, it starts below the x-axis, like it starts down there, and then it goes down. So it's never going to cross the x-axis because it's not going to like turn back up randomly. So if it's starting below the x-axis and it's going, it's going to keep going down, there's not going to be an x-intercept. So none. And then what I started to say for the y-intercept, if we look right here, like we can't really tell what that point is, but we can go and we can find it. So a y-intercept is a point that has like zero for X and then some number for Y. So if I wanna find the Y intercept, I have to find G of zero. I have to put zero in for X in the function. So it'd be negative zero plus three and then minus two outside the radical. So equals negative zero plus three is three and then minus two. And then we're just gonna get a decimal approximation for this. So for a square to three, if you are using like a phone calculator, you have to turn it sideways. You have to make sure it's unlocked um, or like the like sideways turning thing is unlocked. So um, hit three and then the like square root button is like kind of towards the left side in the middle typically. Um, so if you find the square to negative three, it is, or just square root of three, um, it's 1.73 ish. And then we keep that negative in front and then minus two. And then now we'll do negative 1.73 minus two should be negative 3.73. So it's about negative 3.73 for our y-intercept. We'll just write it as a point. So zero and then negative 3.73. And again, just a, an approximation. Okay, so example two, um, h of x equals the square root of x minus two plus four. So this one is a cubic function, so we have to start with the points from the cubic function this time. So that was the one that we did on the left up above. Um, before we get those points, I'm just going to talk about what the transformations are. So h is, again, what part is inside the like radical with the x. Even though it's a cube root function this time, it works the same way. So remember that negative is embedded in the formula, so h is just 2. 
And then K is what is outside of the radical, the constant being added or subtracted after the radical. So K would be 4. So since H is positive 2, that means we would go right 2. And then K is 4, so we would go up 4. Okay, so again, H is left or right. And then K is up or down. And then I'm going to pull the points from the parent function of the like cubic graph and I'm not going to like connect it or anything. I'm just going to get the original points, which you can just look at the table for that. So is that negative eight, negative two, negative one, negative one, zero, zero, one, one, and then eight, two. And then now that I know the transformations, those are the only two transformations there, the two and the four. So I don't have to worry about anything else. I just need to count each of those points, right two, and then up four. If you recognize like what the shape of the graph is, you don't have to do every single individual point. You can just move however many you need and fill in the rest. Um, I'm just going to do each point though. So I'm going to start from like zero, zero. So if I go um, right two and then up four, that lands me right there. And then from 1, 1, right 2, and then up 4. And then from negative 1, 1, or negative 1, negative 1, right 2, and then up 4. And then from, I'm going to go to 8, 2 next. So right 2, and then up 4 right here. And then back to negative 8, negative 2. So right 2, and then uh, right 2, and then up 4. I think that was 4, yeah. And then now I can connect those. So you can see where, like, it is pretty quick if you do it with transformations, especially if there's just translations. I get it like with the first example with the reflection like that is kind of a lot to worry about all at once but if there's just like left or right up or down it's not too bad so it's kind of worth not having to make a table for so we have our new graph i'm sorry that like i'm very bad at drawing the cubic function graph so just ignore it pretend it looks better but now we can answer like domain and range so for cubic functions what's nice is that you know for the parent function, the domain and range were all real numbers. There was no max or min because it was going up forever. That's not changing based on anything. That will always be the same. That is like cookie cutter. Like you could just copy and paste that because that is true for every single cubic function because they'll always go up and always go down. So domain is all real numbers. So you're going from negative infinity to positive infinity. Range, same thing. Or sorry, I'm going to go back. Um, you're always going up and always going down, but for domain, you're always going left and right as well. That's what we're looking at for domain is the x value. So we're looking like the left side of the graph and the right side of the graph, and they're going on forever. Um, domain, or sorry, for range, we are going up and down as well for forever. So range is negative infinity to positive infinity. And because we're going up and down forever, there's no maximum or minimum point. Like there's no high point or low point. It's just infinity and negative infinity. So there's none. And then for the end behavior, this graph doesn't have any sort of reflection. So it essentially looks just like the parent function, just moved up into the right a little bit. So it's going to have the same end behavior. So as x approaches negative infinity, that's the left side of the graph. As x approaches negative infinity, the left side of the graph, if we look at the left side of our graph, it's going downward really slowly, but it's going downward. So that would mean that f of x approaches negative infinity since it's going down. And then the second line of end behavior, this one has two lines because it has like two tails, the left and the right. As x approaches infinity, that's the right side of the graph. So if you look at the right side of the graph, it's going up. So even though it's a little slow, it's still going up infinitely. So f of x is approaching positive infinity. And then for the x-intercept, we... A little bit tricky to find. Um, for the x-intercept, we have to like find, we have to solve to find it. So um, in order to find an x-intercept, you have to put zero for um, h of x in this case. So that's what we're gonna do. 
So that work we'll do like right here. So we'll put zero in for h of x. So that's gonna be, h of x is all the way at the top up here. It'd be zero is equal to, um, let's see, the cubed root of x minus two plus four. Cause x intercepts are the zeros of the function. And so to find the zeros of the function, you have to make the value of the function equal zero. That's why you put zero in for h of x. So, we do that and then we're trying to solve if we're trying to solve this way we have to kind of try to get the cubed root part by itself so we have to isolate it so subtract the four over subtract the four over and then i have negative four equals the cubed root of x minus two and then now i have to get rid of the radical so i have to cube both sides so cube both sides and then um, negative four cubed means negative four times negative four times negative four, which is negative 64. And then that cubing the radical just cancels it out. So leaving with X minus two. And then from there, I need to add the two over. So negative 64 plus two is negative 62. And that's equal to X. So our X intercept, well, our zero is at negative 62. And then our x-intercept is negative 62, 0, is what would put it on the x-axis. Okay, so find things that that's like good review in general for finding x-intercepts. You're finding the zeros, you put 0 in for the function, h of x, f of x, whatever it is. For the y-intercept, you put x into, or 0 in for x. So you put um, x in for 0, so we would find like h of zero. So h of zero is going to be the cubed root of zero minus two and then plus four. So we have the cubed root of zero minus two is negative two plus four. And then same thing, it's a calculator, you're just going to get a decimal approximation. So if you're on a phone calculator, you cube or you negative two, the cubed root is like kind of left middle is best way to describe it um but the cube root of negative two is negative 1.26 ish if we round up from the nine and then if we add that to four so negative 1.26 plus four ends up being 2.74 so 2.74 is what we got for our y intercept so that would be the point zero 2.74 and again it's just like an approximation it's not perfect um it is kind of smart though to like look at your graph and see if it just kind of makes sense like just based on where the graph is and it definitely is because it looked like it was crossing at three based on how i drew it so 2.74 is just like a little bit less than three okay sorry that got really cluttered in there um we can talk about it more in class though as far as like how to find x-intercepts and y-intercepts it is like good review but big thing is just like x-intercepts you put zero in for the entire function and then y-intercepts you put only x equals zero in so before we move on to the last section that's graphing with the table if you know that you are confident graphing with transformations you don't ever have to graph with a table so you can technically stop the video here if you feel fine um, graphing the table is something you can kind of like fall back on if you're not as confident with the transformation. So it is helpful to know, but just it's not entirely necessary if you feel confident the other way. Okay, example three, um, g of x equals two times the square root of x plus five. So a little bit kind of a tricky part about graphing on the table with square roots and cube roots is you can't just pick the same numbers each time. So what I mean by that is I can't use, like in the parent function, we use zero, one, and four, and I can't do that here. I have to think about what x values would let the inside of the radical simplify to zero, one, and four, because those are what I want, like the inside of my radical to become, but there's a plus five in there right now. So like if I put in zero, it would be zero plus five and I'd have to take the square root of five. So that would be less than ideal. So the way that you can do it is you can essentially set up like three different equations. So one for each number that you're trying to get into 
the table or into the radical and you're trying to get 0, 1, and 4 to be what the inside of the radical simplifies to because that's what you can take the square root of. So what I would suggest is take x plus 5 and do x plus 5 equals 0, x plus 5 equals 1, and then x plus 5 equals 4. And you're just setting what's inside of the radical equal to what uh, equal to what you're trying to get it to simplify to. So 0, 1, and 4 for square roots. For cube roots, it would be the like 8 and negative 8 and 1 and negative 1 and so on. So if I were to solve this equation, I would subtract 5 over. I would get x equals negative 5. The second one, if I were to subtract the 5 over, I would get 1 minus 5, so that's negative 4. And then for the third one, if I were to subtract the 5 over, I would get 4 minus 5, so negative 1. So now these are the points that I put in my x values on my table. I do negative 5, negative 4, and then negative 1. And then the kind of nice thing is now the work of simplifying the inside the radical is done for you. Um, I'll show this fast part kind of one time and then I'll do a long way after but like you know that you picked negative five because it got a zero inside the radical so if you wanted to simplify it faster you could just do two because that's what's in front of the radical and then times the square root of zero and it's this or as opposed to like putting the whole thing into the function and like simplifying the whole thing all over again like you picked five for that specific reason to get zero inside the radical you picked four to get one inside the radical, you picked negative, or sorry, you picked negative four to get one inside the radical and you picked negative one to get four inside the radical. So that could save you a little bit of time. Um, I'll just go ahead and find each one individually because I know sometimes it's a little bit confusing to do that shortcut way. So it'd be g of negative five to find the y value goes with it. So um, let's see, two times the square root of negative five plus five and then 2 times the square root of negative 5 plus 5 is 0. The square root of 0 is 0, so 2 times 0 is 0. And then we'll do the same thing but with x equals negative 4. So g of negative 4 is going to be 2 times the square root of negative 4 plus 5. 2 and then negative 4 plus 5 is 1. And then the square root of 1 is 1 times 2 is 2, so this is a 2. And then the last one, x equals negative 1. So g of negative 1. So 2 times the square root of negative 1 plus 5. And then 2 times negative 1 plus 5 is 4. 2 times the square root of, ah, the square root of 4 is 2, so it'd be 2 times 2, which is 4. So this output is 4. And then now I can graph those points. So let's see, negative 5, 0. Um, let's go left 5, and then we don't go up or down at all. And then negative 4, 2, and then negative 1, 4. Like that. And then we'll know that, you know, this starting point, like whatever got me the 0 inside the radical after it simplified, is that kind of start end point on the graph. So the graph should not continue on through the point. That should be like a stop. Okay, so I would really say like the more transformations that you see, the more likely you are um, to use a table versus just transformations. Um, I will say that most of the problems I've seen in the workbooks and in the checkpoints have been pretty transformation friendly, meaning it's something that you could do in your preferred way. You wouldn't be like forced into the table. Okay, example four, h of x equals negative cubed root of x plus two plus five. So for like the numbers that I can take the cubed root of, those were like the initial x values from the parent function. It was zero, one, negative one, eight, negative eight. So that's what I want the inside of my radical to simplify to. So you can do it in your head or you can set up those different equations like we did in example three. I'm just going to go ahead and set them up because I don't think they take that much extra time. But they do certainly make it less confusing. So I would take what's inside the radical x plus two and I'll set it to negative eight first. And I'll just go down my list. The second one will be x plus two 
equals my next like perfect cube, negative one. The next one, x plus two, the part inside the radical equals zero. That's the next thing I can take a cube root of. x plus two equals positive one is my next perfect cube. And then x plus two equals eight. That is my last perfect cube. And then now I just solve each of those for x and that's what goes in my table. So this one, if I subtract the two over, I would get x equals negative 10. So I'll put that first. The second one, if I were to subtract two over, I would get x equals negative three. This one, if I were to subtract two over, I would get x equals negative two. The fourth one, if I were to subtract two over, then I would end up with x equals negative one. And then for the last one, if I were to subtract the two over, I would get x equals six. And then now I'm ready to go ahead and put those like into the function. Instead of doing like the f of this and or h of this in this case, I'm going to go ahead and do the shortcut one for this just because there are more x values. So starting with the very first one, I picked x equals 10 because the inside the radical would simplify to negative 8. So then instead of doing the whole thing, I'm going to say, okay, this would be negative cubed root of negative 8 and then plus 5. The part outside the radical would still be there. And then now, if I take the cube root of negative 8, that's negative 2. So then this is a double negative. So negative, negative 2 is positive 2. And then plus 5 is 7. And then I'm going to go on to the next one. So for the next one, I picked x equals negative 3 because it simplified the inside to negative 1. So this would be negative cubed root of negative 1, and then the plus 5 that's outside the radical, that's still there. And then now negative, or the cubed root of negative 1 is negative 1, but there's a negative in front of it, so the double negative turns it positive, and then positive 1 plus 5 is 6. And then for the next x value, I picked x equals negative 2 because it gave me a 0 inside the radical. So this would be negative cubed root of 0 plus 5. And then cubed root of 0 is still just 0, so I just end up with that plus 5. So this is 5. And then the next one, I picked x equals negative 1 because it gave me a positive 1. So this would be negative cubed root of positive 1 plus 5. The cubed root of positive 1 is 1. There's the negative out in front, so that's negative 1 plus 5, which is 4. And then the last one, I picked x equals 6 because it would make me have an x equal, or it would make me have an 8 inside the radical after the 2 was added. So this is negative cubed root of 8 plus 5. Cute root of 8 is 2, but there is the negative in front, so it's negative 2 plus 5, which is 3. And then now I have my points and I'm ready to graph. I'm going to shrink this down a bit just so it's not covering the... Eh. Yeah, it'll probably be in the way. Okay, I'm going to shrink this down. And then just know, like, if that was confusing and you're like, I don't ever want to see that again, um, you can just put it in the entire function like this and simplify it that way. It just takes a little bit longer, but it's better to take longer and get the correct answer than try to do it fast and not get the correct answer. So um, let's see, negative 10, 7. So I would go left 10 up 7. So it would bring me right here. And then negative 3, 6. So I would go left 3 up 6. And then negative 2, 5. So I'd go left 2 up 5. Uh, negative 1, 4, so left 1 up 4, and then 6, 3, so right 6 up 3. And then I can connect these points, and this is a cubic function, so you just got to keep in mind that it kind of snakes through the middle, um, and then it extends out to both sides. Oh gosh, okay, I don't know why I'm like really bad at drawing these, and like now it's upside down, so I'm like 
going to be pretty bad. So if yours look bad, you should feel better because I draw them all, not all the time, but a lot and they still look bad. Okay, so it goes in both directions forever. And then, like I said, the biggest thing for like making a table is you have to think about what do you want the inside of your radicals to simplify to. Those numbers never change. Those numbers will be 0, 1, and 4 for square roots, negative 8, negative 1, 0, 1, and 8 for cube roots. It's the actual x values you have to put in your table that will change. You can find those actual x values by taking what's inside the radical and setting it equal to the like goal numbers, these ones.